At more than $300 billion, the cost for Australia to acquire a fleet of nuclear-powered submarines is beyond substantial. For the money, though, the country will get enormous firepower, the most advanced and lethal fighting machine humans can build. The submarine spruikers say we'll also obtain something you can't put a price on, stability in our region. China might not agree, but the theory is, by showing our fighting capability, Australia is really proving how much we want peace. Tonight, the United States Navy has given us very rare permission to come on board and test drive one of its incredible attack subs, the Virginia-class USS North Carolina. It's as mesmerising as it is menacing. To feel the force of a nuclear-powered submarine churning through the ocean is so exhilarating, you almost have to remind yourself this is a deadly predator, ready for war. A sinister beast that somehow seems more overwhelming the closer you get. We can't tell you exactly where we are, but somewhere off the coast of Australia, we're about to board one of the best attack boats in existence the USS North Carolina. And she's a sight to behold. One of 22 Virginia-class submarines in the world. The location of the subs at sea is top secret. And this is the first time the crew has boarded civilians in the middle of the ocean. Okay. Whoever wants to come to first, yeah. you gotta step right here. Thank you. To the untrained eye, the body of the beast is a maze of ladders, pipes, cables, and cramped corridors, where up to 130 crew members live and work underwater for months on end. Every day is like one of those movies, you know, where they, the good guys are opposed with all this stuff and you're like, how are they gonna do it? And they come through it. Making sure this boat is ready for war, anytime, anywhere, is ultimately up to the captain, Tad Robbins. Captain, this is just incredible. Is this the best view in the world or what? It is, it is the most amazing view in the world, best job in the world. I know you've been in command here for over a year, but does it still take your breath away? Every day, so every day I walk on the ship, it's a humbling experience and, and, and uh, I don't take a single day for granted. Peace and stability here in the Pacific isn't taken for granted either. China is growing more aggressive using economic coercion and military expansion to bully its neighbours, with its sights set firmly on Taiwan. It's a great power competition the US and its allies can't afford to lose. You're obviously very across various geopolitical threats and tensions. How much does that weigh on your mind, play into your everyday decision making? Uh, certainly it's an ever-changing world uh, right now, but our job is to keep the, the ocean free and open for everyone who wishes to sail uh, in accordance with international law. Uh, so we don't sail uh, at sea without being ready to take this ship into harm's way and to be ready for anything that might come our way. Can things change here on board at any minute? That is why we stay ready every day. Is, every day is a different day, and so things, <laughs> things could change at any, any minute, uh, at any time, so we're ready at all times. So is this onboard communication to the crew? It, it what is. What are we it's, hearing there? Yeah, so we're driving the ship from on top of the submarine right now. So he's talking to the crew below to operate the ship uh, below, since he's at a distance from them. From 2033, Virginia-class submarines like this one will be flying the Australian flag as they patrol the hotly contested Indo-Pacific and beyond. If all goes to plan, under the historic AUKUS deal with the US and UK. It's a huge pivot in Australia's defence policy, 
and will cost taxpayers $368 billion over 30 years. Australia is about to spend a lot of money buying a few of these. It's a well, good investment. It is? <laughs> yeah, yes ma'am. Why? This is the most capable submarine in the world. Uh, and so the fact that Australia is, is getting in with nuclear power, uh, certainly that extends the, the distance at which Australia can sail. And uh, I think the whole country should be excited. I know the United States is excited. From up here, you really get a sense of the enormity of this boat. She is a monster, nearly 8 million kilograms of steel, 115 metres long, capable of carrying a dozen missiles and close to 30 torpedoes. But incredibly, in just a few moments' time, when we dive underwater, this submarine will become essentially invisible, undetectable to anyone. Pilot, prepare to dive. Prepare to dive. Prepare to dive. Prepare to dive. In a matter of minutes, the mighty USS North Carolina is swallowed by the sea. Like a whale diving, there's a peaceful elegance about it, taking on water until only the periscope remains, a final sign of life before the boat vanishes from the horizon into the depths of the ocean. It's so much like an aircraft going into a dive. Now I really feel like I'm underwater. <laughs> <laughs> What depth are we at now, Captain? Uh, so we're now at submerged depth. Uh, so we are under the water, and right now we're just looking to get our buoyancy set correctly so that we can continue to operate submerged uh, uh, for as long as we have our operations down here deep. And technically, how long could that be? Uh, how long could we stay underwater? So you're on a nuclear-powered warship, so we are, you know, we make our own power, make our own water, make our own air. So we're really limited by our food supply. So we could stay down here for months if we needed to. Off deck, man, bow stations, torpedo. Aye, sir. Pilot, man battle stations torpedo. As enthusiastic as the captain is to show off his incredible man machine, he's careful not to say too much and give away the secrets that make this the most feared submarine in the world. Our job is to be undetectable. Our, we like to call ourselves the silent service. You don't show up on, on radars or sonars. That's the idea. So we could approach any other warship or, or landmass and, and they wouldn't know. It's very, very possible. So if there was an enemy submarine a kilometre away, would you know? Our job uh, and, the, and the men you see behind you, their job is to detect the energy that's in the ocean, whether that be marine life or other ships in the ocean. So you're telling me the crew is superior and the boat is superior? Absolutely. Basically. Absolutely. <laughs> and make no mistake, they're armed to the hilt. For our torpedo battery, we can carry up to about three zero torpedoes if we had full loadout. Uh, for our missile battery, we could load up to 12 missiles. Weapons officer Lieutenant James Hunter has a responsibility few of us can imagine. I know this is your job and you're training for this all the time, but does it enter your mind the thought that you could be using these skills in, in a real conflict? It does enter my mind. Uh, it's something I carry with me daily and I actually carry with me on my hip. And I mean that uh, physically. Uh, I have the keys uh, for the tubes, uh, and I carry them around with me at all times. Yeah, it's, a, it's one of the very final steps. If we're going to go into engagement, uh, I'll get permission for the captain, and I'll hand down the keys so we can make the tubes ready. He says the exact range of the weapons on board right now is classified. But Tomahawk cruise missiles can strike more than 1,600 kilometres away almost the distance from Australia to New Zealand. What is it about your weapons set up here that sets the Virginia class apart? Uh, well, for us in particular, uh, really our reload capabilities, uh, I have my torpedo men, and they can spin up and get a weapon ready in less than about 20 minutes. And in a conflict, that's critical. Yes, that's the primary factor that means that we'll be able to win the war. We can respond faster. Just how the crew survive in these conditions is nothing short of astonishing. The kitchen turns over 570 meals a day. With little space to freeze food, it's either made fresh or out of a can. Yes, 
It's a gruelling lifestyle that most of us simply wouldn't manage. Perhaps not surprising, then, that the average age on board is 24. This is my home away from home for the next long time. <laughs> Lieutenant Lauren O'Donnell is one of just three women on the sub. She's also my roommate and assures me it's not as bad as it looks. Yep, so there's three of us all tucked away in this little closet, like we like to call it Harry Potter's closet, <laughs> underneath the stairs. And our only storage is the space beneath our racks. It's a pretty tight space. And honestly, in here, you just, all I do is sleep. So I don't really mind how tiny it is. I don't need a lot of stuff. I wear the same thing every day. I have different sets of these for, <laughs> for washing. Good to know. <laughs> While there's no doubt these boats are impressive, already AUKUS has hit rough seas. In Washington, D.C., intense negotiations are underway to greenlight the deal with Australia. But, as you'll see, there are no guarantees America can fulfil its end of the bargain. Is there a risk, then, that it doesn't happen? From up above, you'd never know that a couple of hundred metres below the surface, a nuclear-powered attack submarine is on the move. Pilot, make your depth 250 feet. Use a 20-degree up angle. Navigating the ocean at extreme angles. Oh, wow. <laughs> so we're diving? We're yes. going down. Leaving the crew and their coffee struggling to stay upright. <laughs> I look for two seconds. Ah. It'll take about three minutes wow. to change that 400 feet. You can feel that pull. Mm -hmm. Is that about testing the, the ship as well? It's testing the ship's capabilities and also testing that our stowage on the ship is... The crew's readiness. Is crew's readiness and the ship's readiness to, to take a large maneuver like this. It's such a weird feeling, isn't it? <laughs> it is. You're probably used to it. it it does take some getting used to. The Americans have been operating nuclear-powered subs longer than any other country. The world's first, the USS Nautilus, was built in 1954 and now rests at its home port in Groton, Connecticut. Frozen in time, the technology has clearly dated. But 70 years on, the realities of life at sea remain the same. As does the town's passion for manufacturing the most advanced boats in the world. When people think of a submarine, you just see this big steel metal structure. When you really get to the nuts and bolts of what happens, the, 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 it's incredible. In this quiet corner of Connecticut, not far from the Nautilus, Joe De La Cruz and his small team make metal parts for the US Navy's growing fleet of submarines. He's incredibly proud, knowing the boats born here will end up providing a huge strategic advantage at sea. We have these surface ships that are everywhere, but we know where all of China's surface ships are and they know where ours are. What we don't know is where the submarines are. <laughs> And that's why it's going to be very critical for not just the U.S., but for other countries to get involved in this technology, uh, because I don't see a, a, a place in time where, where you can just find those things regularly. The ocean's very big. Like all the manufacturers in Groton, Joe's factory is about to get a whole lot busier because he'll be making submarine parts not only for America, but for Australia too. Our government plans to buy between three and five Virginia-class boats, with the first to come under Australian command in 10 years. How did you feel when you heard about the deal involving Australia? Uh, I could not have been happier. When you purchase one from us, it's gonna, it's gonna be done with the same care that we take when we make it for our sailors. But for all the excitement, there are also significant concerns. American shipyards are already struggling to build two Virginia-class submarines a year for their own Navy, let alone fulfil Australia's order. And US lawmakers can't agree on how to share nuclear technology with another country. 
When you think about all the layers of complexity, it is, I would argue, um, as challenging as um, you know, the space program in terms of uh, you know, what it requires of an industrial base. In Washington, D.C., Congressman Joe Courtney goes by the nickname Submarine Joe. He spent his career fighting for shipbuilding in his home state of Connecticut. He's now chair of the AUKUS Caucus here on Capitol Hill, yeah, no, a working group to help Congress understand the complex legislation ahead. It's ambitious, but you're confident this deal will be a success? I believe that there actually is some really strong bipartisan momentum to move AUKUS forward. So we've got work to do, and I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic we're, we're actually going to get some results. How much does the success of the deal rely on the support of Congress in the coming months? A lot. I mean, we, we've got to deal with some structural issues in terms of uh, how this technology is shared uh, with um, a new sort of member of the club uh, in Australia. This has only happened once before, back in the 1950s, uh, when um, Winston Churchill uh, and Harold Macmillan lobbied uh, President Eisenhower and the Congress to include the UK in, in this technology. Uh, and since then, that's, you know, really been the only country that has been really, um, you know, brought into that um, sort of crown jewels of, of the US government. Back home, there's plenty of healthy skepticism I mean, the United States shipbuilding industry isn't what it was during World War II or even during the Cold War. So they're pretty busy trying to address that at the moment. Is there a risk then that it doesn't happen? Well, there's always that risk. That's certainly in the spectrum of potential future outcomes. I think we should have a range of different capabilities in our strategic deterrent beyond submarines. Military strategist Mick Ryan is a retired Army Major General and former commander of the Australian Defence College. His concerns go beyond the logistics of AUKUS to the extraordinary cost to taxpayers here, up to $368 billion. So, I mean, a third of a trillion dollars. When that rolls off your tongue, it actually doesn't roll off very easily. The spending begins right away, but with no new money allocated to fund AUKUS in the short term, the government has to find $3 billion in cuts and savings in the next four years. And as Mick Ryan points out, something will have to give. Is it possible to pay for this out of the existing defence budget? I don't think that's possible at all. We're probably going to have to grow the percentage of GDP uh, that's spent on defence beyond 3%. Uh, we may not be doubling it like the Japanese have, but it's going to have to grow if we want to have nuclear submarines and an Australian Defence Force at the same time. So the numbers don't add up? Well, they don't at the moment. The Defence Strategic Review and the last budget really didn't give us a lot of comfort that the government has a good handle on the future budget for these submarines, as well as having a Australian Defence Force that's modernised and capable of operations on the land, in the air, on the sea, and in cyberspace and in space. With all these moving parts, are we putting all our eggs in one basket? Well, we're certainly putting a lot of eggs in one basket uh, and given other countries in our region are significantly enhancing their defence spending, you know, we really need to look at, well, what's the balance of capabilities in our strategic deterrent over the coming decades? There's no simple answer and it's wise to be cautious when committing hundreds of billions of dollars to anything. But the government warns the threat Australia is facing is so great that only these submarines can deter or confront it. We need to have this capability. $368 billion, it is such a huge sum of money. How can you justify it to taxpayers? Well, they've had an incredible life, the Collins class, haven't they? They have had uh, an incredible life and continue to have that life and they do. After more than 20 years, Australia's fleet of Collins-class submarines is now close to retirement. And Defence Minister Richard Miles couldn't be more thrilled about the first boats to replace them. Nuclear-powered Virginia-class submarines purchased from the US. 
we will become just the seventh country in the world to operate nuclear powered submarines. I mean, Australia's never been in such um, elite company when it comes to military capabilities mm. that we've operated. Unlike the Collins, which has to surface every few days to recharge its electric batteries, the nuclear-powered Virginia can stay submerged for many months at a time. And as we saw on board the USS North Carolina, the boat is undetectable underwater, a huge advantage in deterring or fighting our enemies. Are you worried about China starting a war in our region? China's military build-up forms part of the, the landscape that we live in. Uh, in. In the year 2000, China had six nuclear-powered submarines. Um, by the end of this decade, they'll have 21. Uh, in the year 2000, they had 57 major warships. By the end of this decade, they'll have 200. Um, now, by contrast, what we're seeking to do is replace six uh, diesel electric submarines with eight conventionally armed nuclear-powered submarines over the next 30 years. It's actually a modest step, but it's critically important. These submarines can't be much of a deterrent, though, until they're in the water, and that could be a decade away. Is that too long? Uh, well, it, it, it certainly is important that we have these submarines in the water uh, in about a decade, and I think that will uh, work. But does that leave a gap where we don't have those deterrents for a decade? Uh, no, uh, but it's important that we are able to have this uh, capability in place in the early 2030s. And the price tag is eye-watering. Under the historic AUKUS Pact, Australia will pay up to $368 billion Gold red, gold red. to inherit gold red. between three and five nuclear-powered boats from the US in the 2030s and then build a new design here in the 2040s to complete the fleet. It's such a huge sum of money. How can you justify it to taxpayers? Well, that number is um, an estimate over a very long period of time. It is about 7% of the defence budget. I mean, we are an island trading nation. Um, we are dependent on open sea lines of communication. We need to have this capability. There's so much that we can't project or predict when you're forecasting these figures decades ahead. I mean, look at inflation, the dollar. How can you be confident the numbers will add up? I mean, you're right there. Who knows what the inflation rate will be in, in the mid-2040s, the early 2050s. But what we do have a sense of confidence about is the proportion of this spend relative to our economy. Um, this is worth every cent. A defence spend of this size and price is unprecedented in Australia. And the minister concedes it will come at the cost of other military projects. What are some of the capabilities we won't be able to afford because we're putting so much into nuclear subs? We were looking at infantry fighting vehicles, for example, um, around 450 is what we inherited. Um, so we've scaled that right back um, uh, to about 127. I mean, something else must have to give. Are we talking about destroyers or soldiers or manpower or what, what else? Will well, be? we're not talking about any of those. Um, we'll be uh, conducting a thorough review of the defence estate, for example, one of the largest um, uh, property owners in the nation. And right now we've got significant land holdings in the, the middle of our capitals, which perhaps um, is not where our focus needs to be, given the strategic landscape that we face. And so have some of those decisions actually not yet been made? You don't know yet where those savings and cuts will come. Oh, well, we've made a number of those decisions already, but you're right, this is going to be a process that will be ongoing uh, over the years ahead. The years ahead will also involve intense training for Australian submariners in how to operate and maintain Virginia-class vessels. Some have already graduated from the US Navy's nuclear power school, and many more will soon embed with American and British crews. There is more equipment, technology and components in this space probably than anywhere else in the world. I imagine even the space shuttle when it was in use uh, wasn't quite this complicated. Never been on one, I'm guessing now. Command Master Chief Alex Jones is Chief of Boat and the most experienced officer on the USS North Carolina. He's responsible for everyone's safety and performance, including our own, as we disembark.
conditions are choppy. Fucking hell. And it's a delicate descent down a rope ladder into the waiting police boat. As our slightly unnerving but incredible oh, yeah. assignment comes to an end, I'm struck by how overwhelming the task ahead is for our sailors, scientists, shipbuilders and their families. It's an extraordinary commitment and we're betting Australia's future on it. You are now at the coalface really of a new defence era for Australia that must be exciting but also daunting. And how do you weigh all that up and sort of feel confident in, in your own decisions? Uh, well, it's, it, it's in a sense all of what you've said. <laughs> it is, um, we are confident, but it is also daunting. But getting these decisions right is going to be profoundly important for maintaining uh, the way of life for our kids and our grandkids that we've been able to enjoy. And as an island trading nation, there is no platform which is more important to us than submarines. Hello, I'm Amelia Adams. Thanks for watching 60 Minutes Australia. Subscribe to our channel now for our brand new stories and exclusive clips every week. And don't miss out on our extra minute segments and full episodes of 60 Minutes on ninenow.com.au and the Nine Now app.